Hello, my name is Yana Valakovic. I'm with the University of California Cooperative Extension Program in Humboldt and Del Mar counties. I'm the forest advisor. And for today's portion of the Oak Health Workshop, we're gonna talk about oak woodland restoration and describe some of the new research and new permit options that are helping facilitate restoration of conifer encroached woodlands. This program will be in two parts. The first part will focus on what is conifer encroachment and then describe some of the um, current conditions of encroached stands and some of the regeneration challenges that are occurring. The second part will focus on the effects of restoration and new permits for restoration. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm part of a big team that's been working on this for the last five or six years. And that includes a number of folks that you see on the screen here with the University of California. Uh, we've also been in collaboration with folks at UC Berkeley and at Humboldt State University, along with folks at the Natural Resources Conservation Service, CAL FIRE, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and a whole host of landowners that uh, granted us access to do research, as well as a number of folks in the state legislature and in the Board of Forestry, both staff and um, leadership that helped us uh, move to this new place. So I'm gonna focus in on two species specifically today, Oregon white oak and California black oak. And you can see their distributions shown here. Oregon white oak has a, a pretty broad distribution that comes from Vancouver, British Columbia, all the way down uh, into the Sierras, into the Southern Sierras. Uh, well known from within the Willamette Valley, but also well known throughout California in the Northern portions in particular. Whereas California black oak uh, is more of a California species, as you can see on the map on the right, um, and it's extensively found both in the coast ranges as well as in the Sierra range. These two species often grow together, but sometimes they also are in distinct um, stands on their own. So conifer encroachment is the process where uh, the, the natural element of fire has been removed from the system and it's allowed uh, young conifers to get established in oak woodland stands uh, and that are not uh, taken out or culled by the periodic uh, fire um, regime that would uh, naturally uh, be a part of these landscapes. So these oak woodlands basically thrived and survived in, a, in, a, in an environment in which fire was frequent. Now, after about 150 years of fire suppression, things are changing. And as you can see in this, um, this uh, image here, this is from the Bald Hills in Northern Humboldt, where um, you've got tight transitions between the oak woodlands and the conifer soils. And what's happening is the conifers are creeping into the oak woodland soils. And so within this image, there are oaks that are found throughout uh, that um, that lower section in the, in the image uh, where you can see the conifers in the lower part of the, um, of the image where they're overlapping and growing together. Uh, this is common throughout uh, much of Northern California and even into some, some elements down in Santa Cruz and Monterey. Uh, and so you can see even in drier types where you've got this, this um, change in condition where most of these sands probably were oak woodlands and now we've got these green trees, these taller green trees, uh, uh, piercing the canopies and overtopping uh, the oaks themselves. And given the great heterogeneity of soils uh, within California, it makes sense that it's easy for conifers to do this into oak woodlands because the soils change rather rapidly. And so you can have soils that are well suited for conifers right next to soils that are well suited for oaks. And it makes it easy for them to hopscotch over from the, um, the better fir soils to the oak soils. The challenge is trying to figure out how fast this process is occurring and how much loss we've had uh, over this 150 year time period. Just to illustrate some of um, the stages of conifer encroachment. So this, is, this would be conditions that we might call in the early stages of encroachment where you still may have uh, intact grass communities uh, and floristic communities, uh, but these, but these uh, young conifers are able to um, reproduce in this environment their, their, their seed is able to germinate in these soil environments and then it doesn't take very long for them to occupy kind of the entire mid-story of these stands. On the lower right, you can see how uh, the young, uh, in this case, Douglas fir is in the shade of, I think that's Oregon white oak there, and um, allowing a, a little bit of benefit of the shade to protect those young seedlings from, from the harsh rays of the sun, um, giving them enough extra moisture basically to get established. 
this process rapidly progresses uh, until you see the conifers pierce through the canopies of the oaks. And you may have walked through stands where you see, in this case, Douglas fir and these leaning oak trees. Um, and the Douglas fir is now taller than the oak trees. Uh, and so there, the canopies are dwindling of the oaks uh, and the process is advancing rather quickly. Now, everyone loves oaks and, the, and our cultural connection to these oak trees is well established both uh, in the Native American communities as well as in the ranching communities and the early settlement communities. And, and I'd say in many of us too. Now, fire has been frequently used to help maintain these stands. Um, either natural or prescribed. Uh, so here's a couple images of some prescribed fire that's um, being utilized to try and um, to, to cull or take away those young conifer seedlings. But what's the consequence of this loss of oak woodland condition and this change in habitat? I just really want to emphasize that it's about biodiversity in particular. Uh, the floristic biodiversity in these stands are, is outstanding, and it's well known that that helps attract a um, very diverse and important uh, component of both amphibians, uh, reptiles, mammals, bird species. Um, and so you get these hot spots of biodiversity in these oak woodland stands. And within that, you can see a relatively rapid loss of that floristic diversity. So if you start in the upper left, you can see um, native grass communities uh, that are common throughout these oak woodlands. And then as the conifers close the canopy, um, it moves, the sand moves to a condition where you could almost find no plants uh, growing in the understory. So on the bottom right is a, uh, is a square that we often use to, to measure and calculate how much vegetation is present. And all we see are, is basically a leaf litter uh, and no more plants left in those stands. And these iconic species, um, you know, I think are, are species that as humans we are just naturally attracted to. And it's uh, an interesting question about how long will these, um, th these large California black oak and large uh, Oregon white oak persist on the landscape? And how long will these woodlands be able to survive uh, given this change in fire regime? So we were curious as to whether this was uh, you know, an effect that um, was limited in scale or was broadly distributed. And so using some research dollars from the University of California, we assembled the first project and a, and, a, and a diverse group of folks to try and look at this question. And so we looked, we established 10 sites across two counties. And the question we were really after is how old are the trees and are the oaks really older than the conifers? Because the conifers can be taller and sometimes larger in diameter. And so we assume that they must be older. So we were curious about that fact about that question. And we broke our, our research into three stages of encroachment. This early stage where the, where the Douglas fir uh, is, is in the lower portions of the canopy is really just getting initiated uh, to a mid-story where it's starting to um, compete uh, in that mid-story category uh, for light uh, to a late stage that we characterized where the trees were already piercing through the canopies of the oaks. So our study area um, is shown on the right here uh, from northern Humboldt into southern Mendocino and a little bit into Trinity County. Um, these sites were diverse, uh, both in, um, in location as well as in elevation and in uh, moisture availability. You can see a, a heat map here illustrating the, the, um, the dry to uh, warm and dry Zurich sites to the blue uh, cooler and wetter sites. So you can see that we covered a range in there. And the conditions were that we had to have both all three stages of encroachment present on the site. So, so, so sites with basically um, very little encroachment all the way to a much more rapid um, and advanced stage of encroachment. So we uh, had a, a variety of, uh, of science tools that were used. We established um, uh, quarter acre plots or 10th hectare plots, um, three in each of these sand conditions. Um, and we collected a whole lot of data, which we're still even sifting through, that characterized the oaks and the firs, as well as the seedlings, saplings, uh, understory vegetation, assessed oak health, uh, along a whole variety of, of metrics. 
we cord uh, a lot of trees to be able to establish um, these age structures. So over 1,700 trees were cored. Um, and we even had five of our sites where there was active cattle grazing and five of our sites where there was not. So that was well balanced. And so what did we see in tree composition? So some interesting, interesting trends. So if you look at the sites with essentially very early stages of conifer encroachment, they were dominated by white oak and black oak, just a little bit of Douglas fir, and then uh, a, you know, a handful of evergreen hardwoods as shown in green here. And as you progress to the later stages, you can see that 68% of the sites were dominated then by Douglas fir. So it switched from 10% to 68%. Now that's sort of proving the obvious. That's what we're after um, evaluating. Um, but it's interesting to look at the statistics. And what happens is you see the white oak um, from those early stages in the 65% category and towards the later stage, it's down to 15% because um, the trees are beginning to fall out of the system due to um, competition and stress. So are the oak trees really older than the fir trees? And the answer is resoundingly yes. Um, this is a complicated graph here that I wanna show. Um, and it's what it's looking at is from about 1650 all the way to present day on the x-axis. And the trees are coated in color. So the white oaks are in this white gray pattern. Uh, the black oaks are in black, uh, and the Douglas fir is in red. And there's a, there's a smoothing average that goes across those. That's what the, the squiggly lines are. And you can see that we have um, oak trees that go out to 1,650 uh, as a time of establishment. I'll say that our older trees are a little harder to characterize because as you core those trees, you're more likely to have run into a tree that has experienced some kind of fire or damage along the way. And so you get rotten cores. So it becomes difficult to really get an accurate age for those older, bigger trees. And our study really didn't skew towards older, bigger trees. We were really sampling the 10 closest oak trees to our, to our plot centers. But what we see is that there's a large pulse of oak regeneration that, or oak, uh, I'm gonna call it regeneration, not establishment, but um, a time period for those stems being, being on the site that, uh, that starts around 1850, both in Oregon white oak and California black oak. But then what you see is this pulse of fir regeneration that's much older, um, really getting kicked off 1940s or so. There's a couple humps in there. There's you know a little bit of noise, but there's really clearly two distinct um, phases of establishment. The oaks are significantly older and the, and the fir trees are significantly younger. Now it's hard to be able to turn back time and see what our landscape looked like. So we've been working with historic air photos. Those date back to about the early 1940s. That gives us some indication. But we can see that you know, things began to change in 1850, so you can't really go back far enough. Um, I've also been using the Wieslinger vegetation um, mapping and photo collection series that's at UC Berkeley. Uh, here's an image from 1938, and you can see these more open um, oak stands, but there is some dispersed amount of Douglas fir, maybe even a little bit of pine in this stand. Um, so some of these photos become helpful to try and help us reconstruct what happened in these stands over time. One of the questions that comes up commonly is, well, is this tied to climate? Uh, can we learn something from climate when we're thinking about these issues? So this is the same data set um, in five-year smoothing averages uh, with the Palmer Drought Severity Index laid across the top. That's what the blue line is. And so in trying to understand that um, pulse of oak regeneration, either the white bars or the black bars, um, if you overlap that with the, the blue um, drought severity index across the top, you know, you really don't see any patterns between the two. Like you don't have a peak that goes up at the same time and a valley that happens at the same time. But when you look at the Palmer drought severity index and fur, there is some, um, there is some correspondence. And I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but there's a big valley uh, or trough of um, drought that occurs and the fur establishment declines during that period. And then there's a big pulse that occurs around uh, 1950s or so. And that also kicks off with when the fur establishment happens. So the fur is definitely tied in some ways to what's happening with the amount of available moisture uh, and more able to respond to that. So it explains more of what's going on uh, with, it explains some of what's going on with the fur. 
There are other things that happen. Um, we can't turn back time to know, but certainly the gold rush happened in 1850, uh, 1849. So the, the, the timing is probably more than coincidental. Um, we speculate that the amount of game uh, meat that was required for those settlers and for those gold miners was significant. Um, and so there likely was a significant change in the deer populations during this time period. And that may have influenced uh, the oak survival because deer are known to be browsers and eat uh, young oak seedlings um, quite intensively. Fire suppression overlaps in this. So there's a lot of things we don't understand, um, but there are some interesting patterns worth noting. One of the things that I think is particularly interesting is this question of how many of the oak trees today that we see are from multi-stem clumps uh, as opposed to single stem clumps. And the, the distinction is, is that when you have a multi-stem clump, it, it reflects some kind of disturbance in the past, whether that's fire or mechanical damage. So that means that the genetics were on the site, that you know, the original or an, or an original tree was present had some period of disturbance and then re-sprouted around that. And so when you look at our white oak and black oak, um, we can see that 25 to 30% of the, of the regeneration is um, multi from multi-stemmed individuals. So that tells you that the genetics have been there longer than the time period of establishment. And that's an important attribute in thinking about this. So, from a, from a forester's perspective, we like to think about metrics like basal area, which is the amount of square foot of area that's in tree. And um, so in the early stages, on average, we have about 147 square feet of oak basal area in these stands, and it declines rapidly uh, down to 76 square feet of basal area in the later stage. Now, those metrics are important because they key into our regulatory system, and I'll describe that in the next section. But this data was used to help guide um, some changes in our regulations to help facilitate restoration. One of the other interesting pieces is what's regenerating? I mean, so we might have oak trees, but do they, are they still viable? Can they still produce seed, even if they're experiencing this, um, this encroachment? And, you know, who's, who's, a, who's staying alive in these stands? Are seedlings able to graduate and grow into size classes like such as saplings or pole trees? So if you look at this, at this graphic, um, the yellow bars are the, the highest a proportion in each of these bins. So the top, the top set of rows is about the early stage of encroachment, and white oak has the most seedlings in the stand. So they are producing a lot of acorns that are viable enough to make seedlings, but they don't mature into the sapling side classes. Whereas Douglas fir is producing just a little bit of seeds um, in, these, in these young stands, uh, or these early stage of encroachment stands, but the saplings are clearly the winners, clearly the ones that are surviving. 95% of the saplings present in this early stage of encroachment is uh, from the Douglas fir. So the oak seedlings are present, but they don't mature and make it to the next size class. So what's happening there? Whereas um, in the mid stage, you can see that we're starting to get a little less survival of the oaks themselves. Um, they're still the greatest uh, in producing seedlings, um, but there's a lot more seed from other species as the sites begin to get more um, mesic, more wetter, uh, as you've got the canopy closing in. Um, but clearly, the, the red Douglas fir, as shown here, is the dominant sapling in all three stages of the encroachment process. And you start to get some other hardwoods coming into these stands. So, Seed is viable, acorns are viable, but they're not maturing into the sapling size class, but the Douglas fir is. So another important question is, how fast is this process happening? And so as I wrap up this portion of, of the webinar, um, I'd like to just end with this idea that it does vary. It does vary by site, but it can happen rather quickly. So the time to conifer co-dominance on these sites can be as short as 20 years to as long as about 80 years. So these, this period of change, um, conversion from an oak woodland site into a conifer-dominated Douglas fir site is happening in our lifetimes. Um, so this process is something that um, we need to pay attention to because it's happening rather quickly. So I'm going to wrap up today's portion or this section's portion, and um, we will carry up with the next piece about what do we do with this data. Thanks very much.